Hi, my name is Neil and this is the 12 basic principles of animation. Okay, so where do we start? The, when people refer to the 12 principles of animation, they usually refer to The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston. This book is considered, uh, it was considered then and now as the Bible of an animation. Uh, basically, Thomas and Johnson took the experiences of virtually every artist that had worked since the 1930s for Disney and culminated their work and experience into a set of defining principles that was supposed to help the up-and-coming artist um, sort of learn a, a better, a good practice is probably the best way to put it. The good thing about this book, and actually the brilliant thing about this book, is that the rules were written when um, animation was two-dimensional in, in display. Now we have 3D, um, we have amazing, amazing visual effects, and the beauty of it is that these principles are as relevant for that as they were back then. Okay, so let's have a look at the principles. Number one. Squash and stretch. Squash and stretch is used to, how can I explain this, to get a, an object or a character to adhere to real world physics. When, a, when an object is struck, it changes shape. When a body falls from the sky, hits the floor, it squashes. There's, there's, um, it's, it's a good way of displaying um, a, a, a physical property of, of an object or character. If I show you this, the ball on the left, uh, it's time to bounce, it's got uh, arc of movement, it's got easing, so it bounces correctly, but it doesn't have the physical properties of a ball. The ball on the right, on the other hand, when it hits the ground, it squashes, it pushes itself out, and when it goes back up, the, the reverse animation is animation, reverse physics is played, and the ball stretches as it travels, hence squash and stretch. The one important factor with this, and to make squash and stretch look like it's actually it's, it's actually a physical property, is that the object must never ever lose its mass or volume. In other words, it should never shrink, it should never get bigger. It should, if it goes out, it should go down. If it, go, if it squashes in, it should stretch up. Okay, anticipation, second rule. This is a, this is a pretty cool rule. Uh, it, it's a very good way of, of portraying... How can I explain this one? <laughs> okay, anticipation. A movement of anticipation is to show your audience that a movement or an action is about to take place. Uh, if you take these two little guys here, they sit there, they have a little sneaky look around, and then they swap places. The movement of anticipation being the sneaky look around before they jet off and swap places. It's, um, it's a br it is used in virtually every animation you could possibly think of. The, the anticipation is an incredibly important and powerful property to have in, in a piece. It, it just basically it, it gives everything um, a real-world feel. I mean, it's, it's take for instance when someone punches something. They don't suddenly throw their fist out. They, they, they usually pull a facial expression. Uh, they wind back. Their body becomes rigid, and then the punch happens. So it's that moment of anticipation that gives it a real, almost like a realism. If you have a look at this animation, I did this for us for C a couple of years ago. This is, uh, it's full of moments of anticipation. Little boy looks around, jumps off, camera then jumps with her forward, climbs up, takes another look around, flips himself up onto the seat, looks around again, and then all of a sudden everything starts happening, falls backwards in the seat. So anticipation, it's a really good way of, of like I say, portraying a movement in, 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 with realism. Okay, staging. What is staging? Staging, uh, the, guys for, the, the guys at Disney will tell you, is directing the audience's 
vi uh, visual awareness into the, the the thing that you want to see the, them to see the most. You want them to dis to concentrate on that one thing, no matter what else is going on around in your in your scene. There's always that 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 element that you want the audience to be looking at. It's the, the most important part of the action, as it were. Uh, there's many ways of doing this, like in this animation here, for instance. I mean, the, I, it, the shot is pretty much unbroken. In fact, in this animation, the car's not actually moving, it's everything else is moving around it. And the camera, the, the car is actually stationary. The floor is skipping underneath it. The whole point was the client wanted, they were uh, promoting the new Kia Sorento, and therefore they wanted that in shot at all times and for that to be the focus and the most important part. You can do this in many different ways. That's one way of doing it. Using depth of field is another way of doing it. This one, same again. The most important part of this animation, if we scrub back quickly. This is for a company called Telescope, the one I currently work for. And if I just pause it, what they wanted was an animation that uh, I think they were kind of scared that the word telescope was not coming across. It's obviously Welsh for telescope, and it wasn't coming across. So they wanted a little sting animation. They wanted to send out so that English speakers would, you know, they would they would recognise this word and uh, associate it with its English meaning, telescope, not telescope. So with this, the focus of the animation is this old brass telescope I modelled. And it was actually done for an e-card, so you have this little message at the end, sort of played out in particle effects or whatever. The dotted cloud in Merry Christmas, that sort of thing. But uh, the the whole point of staging there was to have this beautiful room, but you, bur you virtually don't pay any attention to it at all. You're just concentrating on what the artist myself was directing you at. And that's that. Okay, straight ahead and pose to pose action. Right, okay. This, uh, these are two techniques uh, that we used in 2D art or 2D animation. Uh, a brief explanation of straight ahead. Straight ahead action was um, the process of drawing something frame by frame. So if you had, say, for instance, a butterfly flying around a tree or uh, flapping its wings, you would draw each individual frame. So you draw the butterfly there, wings open, then you next through the next scene, butterfly moved across, wings open further, and you build up your animation in frames like that. The problem with this is that when you're drawing something over and over again, it's very, very hard to maintain the proportions. Now the reason they use straight head action and that to the style was that it is a very, if you get it right, it looks perfectly fluid. But what someone eventually came up with, I think it came around about the sort of stop motion time, was keyframing or post pose action. Now then, if you look at the example on the screen that's playing at the moment, the guy swinging the baseball bat. If you look at the guy on the right, every time that flash is red, that's a keyframe. So basically, what, what would happen is this, you draw the keyframes in first and then you would draw the action in afterwards. So you do what is known as tweening. You'd have a tweening artist. You have a key artist and a tweening artist. Key, a key artist writes the keyframes and the tweening artist then would go back and fill in the blanks in between. So say for instance if uh, this animation is 20 frames long, there's four keyframes that means the other 16 would have to be filled in by a tweening artist. And this is, this is a much, much more reliable way of constraining proportion. Certainly was in the 2D uh, animation world. Nowadays, keyframing is the absolute must because most animation is done within 3D. And that's how it works. You don't tend to work with straight ahead action at all. You tend to work with post-to-post -post keyframing. Okay, follow through an overlapping action. Overlapping action is, well, follow through and overlapping action is the principle of having more than one motion, uh, or more than one timing, in the same subject. Take, for instance, the example here. You've got 
The body moving up and down in a, virtually in a circle of the sheep. And you've got the legs running double time to that. Then you also have its head nodding up and down. And this is also follow through action. Its head is one unbroken loop. It's going through up, then down, then up, then down. It's not, st it's not stopping at specific keys. It's not rigid. It's going up, through, down, through, up, through, down, through. And that is basically the principle of overlap in action. It makes for realism. And I'll show you how this works in the next example. This is actually motion capture data of someone juggling. And so this is actually a real movement. This isn't keyframed or animated. This was shot with a guy in a mocap suit, and then he, it, the data was extracted from that, and then it was put onto this 3D model here. Now, if you look at him, none of him is still for a start, or very, very little of it is still. But everything is moving in flux. He's got his hands moving up and down, his hips swaying side to side, his head is looking where the ball should be, he's walking back and forth. This is secondary action. It promotes, like squash and stretch, realism in a character. If you can master this technique, it's one of the, the brilliant things. Of, you know, it, it, it really does bring your stuff to life. It's an incredible skill to have. Okay, slow in, slow out. Or as it's called now, easing. Right, where do I begin with this? Okay, it's, uh, this is physics. Basically, no... No moving object is constant. It has an acceleration, then a consistent speed, and then a deceleration. If you look at the two examples, first of all, take the bottom one. This is linear projection. It's moving in a constant speed over a, a specific duration. And if you have a look at the graph above it, that's it, you can see it. That's, that's its trajectory. It goes from one end to the other over time and distance. Now, if you look at the example above, look at the, the tangent on its tra trajectory. Basically, over it, it starts off slow, and you can see that it doesn't increase in its distance very much. Then it goes up and across. So, basically, it goes slow in, slow out. And if you look at the difference between the two arcs, you can, and then look at the difference between the two animations, you can see how the principle works. And this is it in, in used in motion graphics, slow in, slow out. If uh, if you you know, what what happens if you don't use slow in, slow out? Things tend to jar and pop. Whereas if you look at this example, little plates swing in fast, slow down, and speed up again to remove themselves. It's a very basic principle, and in modern um, programs, it almost comes as a, a, a an absolute. Um, you know, it's, it's a tool, and it's usually either called easing or curve editing. So, and like I say, very, very important to maintain a, a, also a realistic look. Okay, arcs. The principle of arcs, the, the Disney guys once again realized that nothing travels in a straight line. When a ball is thrown, it goes across and up, and then eventually will come back down obviously representing, in this case, representing gravity. Now, it seems pretty intuitive that if you throw a ball up, it comes back down. Same if you swing your arm over, it comes back down. But the one thing, the one important thing with this, so you can see the tangent on the graph again, is that we have 2D arcs and we also have 3D arcs because now we work in 3D. Now then, the ball is traveling on its X position from left to right. That is shown on the graph in the green. It's also traveling in the Y position, and that would be its height. But also now we have a thing called Z depth, or Z position. And that's further away, like going into the screen or coming at you. And on this graph, that's represented by the red line. So as at the top of its arc, it's the further, uh, furthest away, and at the end of each uh, end of the graph, it's as close to you as it's going to get. So that Z depth, this is like a, a really, really big step in 3D development, in 3D animation to get your head around 
you're not just working on two planes, you're working in 3D space. And that Z depth or Z positioning is, is something that you need to become, it needs to be second nature for you. The great thing with this is that if, you, when you, if and when you do sort of get that idea in your head, it makes two-dimensional artwork so much easier. Your perspective, but it really gives you a great idea of perspective and gives you a, a sort of visual understanding of it as well as a, a technical understanding. This is 3D arcs being used in uh, in a 3D program. Um, this animation is pretty simple to animate. It, was, it actually took longer to build the little rocks and planes. So this is actually all on a path. You've got the three little planes following a motion path in 3D, easing their way, roll and bank with it. So that's arcs, and very, very, very important, very important today. And obviously with that third dimension that you have now, uh, something that's also a really powerful tool within animation. Okay, secondary action. Secondary action is a lot like um, the one we referred to earlier, which was um, like doubled up action or follow through action. Secondary action um, more describes an entire scene. If you take this scene, for instance, when it loops back around, we'll, uh, we'll rewind that for you. Everything is in flux. Once again, it's to promote realism. You don't look out of your window in the morning and just see a car riding past. Leaves are blowing down the street. There's someone opening a door. There's, uh, you know, the clouds are moving in the sky. Everything is in flux, and it gives you this idea, of, or this, this deceptive idea of realism. And if you take, for example, now, you'll probably, when you watch this for the first time, you probably don't even notice that, you know, half the stuff that's going on. But you have stuff falling, you have the fireworks going off, the smoke drifting off, the train going round and round, which is also uh, blanking out the, the test plates. This is secondary action in process. If you want to see that quickly again. Basically, it is a really great way to, to like I say, to populate uh, a scene with movement. And if you'll just bear with me while my computer catches up with itself. <clears throat> okay, timing. Okay, right. I'll go out on a limb here and say timing is the most important aspect or principle for animation. If your timing is not correct, your animation just will not look right. It won't matter how well you draw, how well you 3D model, how brilliant your lighting is, your textures, nothing will matter if the timing is out. So I put this example together quickly to show you, you know, how you can get correct timing on my little floating drag car race. Okay, so timing. In this example, this was a this was a little sting I did for E4. I had 50 seconds to put this. The, the, the duration was 50 seconds, no more, no less. So I had to have everything timed perfectly. So little man up to shake, jump, splash, shake around, curtain comes down, and he's out the front, takes a bow. So it was all about the timing. Now timing being one of the most difficult things to get together and to get your head around. In modern animation, you have quite a few awesome tool sets that will help you out with it. Just as an example, if you learn to code correctly, or to code, I did this. This isn't hand animated, this was animated in action script. Basically what I wanted, I wanted my name to light up in lights as other lights touched them. So when one of these little pixels dropped down and touched a light that was in my name, I wanted that light to then spark to life and then fade. Now, that's easy enough to animate with one little spark, but if you throw into the mix that I wanted almost a hundred of them duplicated three times to give a 3D effect, 
and I also wanted the movement to be random, or to certainly appear random, I didn't want to have to animate each one individually. It just would not have been worth it. It would have taken me forever for very little result. So what I decided to do was use collision detection, which you can't animate, but the computer understands it. So if you use a small program and say, right, okay, whenever this pixel touches this pixel, I want this to happen, you can get some really, really big effects very, very quickly using it. Now, the reason I brought this up is because this is, you know, this is one of the principles that, that can, you can really be helped out with with modern tools. So if I play the animation through, you can see this sort of random drop of it. Oh, another piece for timing. This was an absolute nightmare. In fact, I would not have been able to do this if I'd not been able to um, use expressions and code the, the, to get everything running in the same, uh, you know, in, in synchrony. It's a very, very difficult piece to time. Actually, the, the, the animation took a lot longer than, than I anticipated simply because I thought that I could do it by hand and then I had to go back to the drawing board and, uh, and, and retime it using, using code. And it was done for, obviously, in the dark productions. And I think they were happy with it. <laughs> okay, exaggeration. This one is... Uh, how, how do I explain this one? Okay. Exaggeration is used to get over to your audience uh, an action that may well have been overlooked, maybe? Or uh, may have seen seemed inconsequential. So we use exaggeration um, to really get the, the audience to focus on that, that, that one thing that you want them to see. Now, I've used this example here, I've got to be honest, it's, it's one of my most favorite animations. And uh, this is Daryl Hannah, um, Fred Quimby's uh, Tom and Jerry, absolutely brilliant. They were the masters of this. They were, the exaggeration is, is paramount in their cartoons. Okay, so ex what, what exactly is exaggeration? Okay, well, first of all, have you ever seen someone play a guitar like that? No. no, nobody plays guitar like that. They might look like they're playing guitar like that, but they don't play guitar like that. Have you ever seen anyone's moustache move like that when they talk? No. Or swing around when they turn their head? No. It's exaggeration. But when you watch the clip back, it's just absolutely perfect. Really, really amazing. I can't say more uh, for the, the skills of the guys who put this stuff together. It's absolutely incredible. But um, exaggeration, yeah, a, a, a really, really good tool to use to, to, to portray an event. And you don't just need to animate exaggeration, you can incorporate it in, in your design. Take for instance these two I did for a Dawn of War mod. Um, if you look at this guy here, he's supposed to be human or humanoid. He's in this gigantic set of metal armor, which no human would ever be able to carry. But the thing is, if this guy was actually real, his shoulders would have to be about six foot wide. His, his legs would have to be longer than his, his arm span, and then his arm span is just ridiculous. His hands would have to be the size of a, I don't know what, like dinner plates. But for some reason, when you put something like this together, um, you can still make it believable. You know, it still has that, you know, I think what works with this one is that although he is humanoid, he's, he's got a pretty inhuman face, and it's sort of cuts it, you know, that you can believe it. Same with this guy on the right, this is um, Commissar Yarrick. He's supposed to be 70, and it turns out he, he, he must be pretty strong because he's got an arm made out of metal that probably weighs more than he does. And I don't think that he'd be able to walk <laughs> in, in a street, probably walk in circles. But 
the exaggeration here, it, it almost seems outweighed by the fact that this guy is obviously like quite a strident, powerful character, and I think, you know, there's certain things that you can just get away with, and I mean, with fantasy, you really need to be able to, to push the boundaries on your design and get them to look as completely outrageous as, as possible. Okay, solid drawing. Right, solid drawing. This is a this is an interesting one. I tell you, the book that on the rule says that the animator must be the perfect draftsman, and what that means is that I think you need a good solid background in traditional art methods to become a great animator. That's the that's the trick. I think that. You know, like it's all very well understanding the principle. It's all very well, you know, being able to model in 3D and do all these things. But I think that the really, you know, the basic skill of being able to put pen to paper and get your idea down and make it look brilliant, that is what this is all about. And I think that that, that is the thing, you know, take for instance this example. You want to start off, you just drop, drop it down. I mean, I'm by no means the best artist in the world, like by a long shot. But even I can get my ideas down on paper and then turn them into 3D, like the example on the right. And, you know, the 3D model is much more impressive than the 2D, but I would never have been able to get to this stage if I didn't have my original reference to work from. So <clears throat> I think solid drawing really sort of tries to punch home that you know, even though you know you may be a great animator, you still need that traditional background in drawing and 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 painting and and all the other sort of you know manual art skills you know that are not on screen. They do, they like say they like the set of rules. They are just as relevant today as they were back then. Okay, appeal. <laughs> kind of like the the drawing one really it is um it's such an open so it's such a massive subject you could you could talk for hours about this i think the couple of minutes that i've got left here uh for this it would just wouldn't even be sufficient to go into it but it reiterates that with, with appeal you need to get your fundamentals absolutely solid drawing painting you know that you need to be immersing yourself in the stuff to get this um this skill to to draw something that is appealing to the eye or to produce something that is appealing to the eye there are many rules many many rules such as facial you know using facial symmetry for good characters unsymmetrical for for bad characters using Big ears for a, a, a character that may be a little slow. The list goes on. But I pulled up this example because it was where I had to refer to the list to get this particular piece right. I did this for Pandar and Whiskey. And they wanted a, a, like a, a character. Now, we talked about a dragon. And when I'd seen the, the pictures of their, their fa I should say factory, the distillery, it was all very copper and cogs and wheels, and I liked the idea. Of that. I thought we would take it in that direction. Now, my original design was far too sinister. It just looked too sinister. It, it, it didn't look, it, it looked too overbearing, you know, big teeth. And... So what I did was I used the body, and the only thing I changed on it was its mouth. Instead, I put a big sort of dragon nose on it. And this dragon nose changed the entire look of, of this piece. And uh, now it, it, it's still got that kind of rough and ready look, but it just doesn't look sinister anymore. It looks like it, it's six inches tall and you'd want to take it home and, and, you know, have it as your pet. So with appeal, I think I have, like I say, we haven't got time to go into all of it, but I think appeal is just looking at what's out there and what works and then incorporating it into your designs, looking for the rules within the rules. And that is the 12 principles of animation. And I think that some people say there's bits missing from it. Uh, some people say, I mean, I can think of loads of things. This, like sound would be one, uh, key sounding. Um, you know, there's the whole, th you know, the, the, the 3D aspect 
of um, of design now that, that there's probably half a dozen rules there that, that need to be adhered to but I think that this is a very, very the 12 are a very very good starting place and that's pretty that's pretty much it so thank you very much for listening I was Neil Goss <laughs>